Would you open your Bibles to Exodus 20, please? Today we look at the second commandment, which builds quite a bit off of Bill's message last time. The first and second commandment overlap quite a bit. We will be looking at verses 4 through 6. Take a look at them with me. You shall not make for yourself a carved image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them or serve them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children to the third and the fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing steadfast love to thousands of those who love me and keep my commandments. Let's pray. Lord, we ask for your help as we come now to your word that you have inspired. Lord, would you fill me to preach only truth? And would you fill our congregation to hear with open ears and hearts that we all would be changed because we've sat under your word today? Do it for your glory, we ask. In Jesus' name, amen. Our society is as irreligious and antagonistic to religion as it's been in my lifetime. And yet there is a deep-seated irony in that. Have you noticed the irony? I don't think society has. Our society functions according to some very strict doctrines. It worships at the altar of fame, self-expression, and relativism. Our economy is largely built on idolatry, designed to create discontent while promising contentment if you just upgrade your phone, trade in your car, accrue enough clicks, likes, or retweets. Society's doctrines, ironically, tell the independent free thinkers exactly what they should think and believe. They don't call their idols gods, but they worship them like they are. And before we get all puffed up, folks, many of society's gods have crept into the church. Let's be a little more honest with ourselves. Some of society's gods have openly been invited into the church, which only reflects that apart from the grace of God, we are just as vulnerable to idolatry as they are, which means we all need the second commandment. We all need it. Why? Our hearts are prone to wander, prone to leave the God we love. Calvin says our hearts are idle factories. We have the uncanny expertise of turning just about anything into something we serve as a God. We need today's message. We need this commandment because we possess idolatrous hearts. Now, before we get to the heart of the commandment, there's a couple questions the text raises. I want to answer them. I think it'll serve us to deal with those things up front. First, what does it mean when it says that God is a jealous God? We've got to be careful that we don't associate God's experience of jealousy with our own. He is not sinning in his jealousy. He's not insecure. He's not codependent. He's not bitter. When we read something that perks up our ears like that, we've got to remember God is always right in what he does, and God is right in how he does it. So what does this mean? Remember, God entered into a covenant with his people, and that was long before our text 
and it's true even today. That covenant is an exclusive relationship between God and His people, the bridegroom and the bride. And so devotion to Him and Him alone is right and good and appropriate. The inverse is also true. Our wandering from Him is wrong and harmful and inappropriate. So in God's holy jealousy, He declares He will not share you with another God. He will not share you with another spouse. He will not share you because you belong to God. And we need to thank Him for being wholly jealous because it's for our good that He will not share us. He's not keeping us from something good. His jealousy protects us. His jealousy says, no, 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 I will oppose you as you drift from me because the best thing for you is full devotion to me. It's what it means to have a jealous God. The second question that this text raises that I want to just deal with up front is why should future generations suffer for the sins of their parents? If you take a look at verses 5 and 6, that seems to be the case. Kids are stuck with blessing or curse as determined by their parents. But we always use Scripture to interpret Scripture, and Ezekiel 18 helps us here. 18.20 says this, The soul who sins shall die. The son shall not suffer for the iniquity of the father, nor the father suffer for the iniquity of the son. The righteousness of the righteous shall be upon himself, and the wickedness of the wicked shall be upon himself. That seems to say pretty clearly God does not pass punishment from a guilty parent to an innocent child. Well, if He doesn't do that, what is He talking about in Exodus 20? If it's not that, what is it? Through our conduct, our individual choices, the sins, the idolatry that we commit, we are building a culture in our homes, in our churches, and in the community. And as we build that culture, we are sowing seed to future legacy. It may be a good one. It may be a bad one, but it's a legacy either way. So this commandment calls us to look at what we are sowing into future generations. Are we living in such a way that those who come after us will be blessed? Are we living in such a way that those who come after us will be cursed? But this is going even further. It doesn't just call us to look at future generations, it calls, calls us to turn around and to look at past generations. Listen to what DeYoung says. He says, you can't say, I'm only doing what my parents taught me. You can't excuse your obedience by pointing to your upbringing or culture or personal history. God will punish the next generation if they continue in the sins they learned from the previous generation. That's the point of the warning. So, we know young people learn as they watch older people live. If idolatry is rampant in your house, it's likely to be passed down to generations to come. But, at the same time, each generation will give an account for its own conduct and its own beliefs. The sins of the parent make it easier for the children to sin in particular ways. However, in the end, the responsibility for our sin falls squarely on us. So it falls on each of us us in our generation, our kids in theirs, to consider how we're sowing 
and to evaluate the choices we are making so that future generations have not condemned me to certain pathways, nor am I actively condemning future generations, but we all take responsibility to live in repentance and humility before God. The call of this text is let's not blame those who have gone before, but let's take responsibility to make holiness easier for those who will come after. Okay, those are the two questions that seem real important to clear up. So you're not saying, when's Rob going to get to that punishing the kids thing? <laughs> now I want to look at the heart of this commandment, which is idolatry. Look at the beginning there. You shall not make for yourself a carved image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath, or that is in the water under the earth, you shall not bow down to them or serve them. And I want to just state clearly up front, covenant fellowship is not exempt from this. This is not an ancient command. In this current age, we are still very much in danger of violating this command. And I'm just going to highlight three ways we can fall into this trap Number one, we make idols out of creatures. Norm Wakefield here points out the danger. Listen to what he says. Although our idols are seldom made of wood or stone, we still use raw natural material of flesh and bone. The spirit of idolatry tempts man to look to creatures for happiness. Husbands look to wives, wives look to husbands, parents look to children, children look to parents, employees to jobs and employers, employers to employees, church members to pastors, pastors to church members, and on and on it goes. All of these fall into the forbidding category of the earth beneath. To be clear, there's nothing wrong with husbands and wives, children's parents of all days, saying there's something wrong with fathers on Father's Day would be awkward. But when we look to any creature as our hope for happiness or our obstacle to peace, when we place the state of our souls on any creature's approval, when we look to man, when we ought to be looking to God, we elevate that creature to the creator, to where the creator ought to be. What are we doing when we do that? We're supplanting God. So let me ask you, teens, is there someone whose acceptance matters so much to you that you can't rest until you get it. Church, do your hearts rise and fall on what a particular person thinks of you, for the better or for the worse? Is your confidence in God and His Word shaken when you face the reality that community group leaders, deacons, and pastors are sinners too? If so, could it be you've unintentionally elevated a creature to a level no creature belongs? We make idols out of creatures. Number two, we make idols out of desires. Now, perhaps you're not as prone to idolizing creatures. This may be another area you can fall victim. James tells us that conflict often arises because of the desires that are waging war within us. While they're raging, we're willing to sin to get what we want. When we're willing to step away from God to get a desire, it is clear evidence we've placed the desire above God. We're even capable of taking desires for truly good things and turning them into idols. 
Pallison says, the evil in our desires often lies not in what we want, but in the fact that we want it too much. Natural affections for any good thing become inordinate ruling cravings. Now, maybe you're a parent, and all you're asking for is respect. Maybe you're a spouse, and you just want peace in your marriage. Maybe you're an employee who wants to, to a better job or someone who is single who wants to be married. Maybe you're a teen. You just want to feel like you belong. Perhaps you find too much of your identity in sexual desire, in social groups. Friends, this list could go on and on, the things we can idolize in our hearts. For me... The idol I fight most in my heart is the idol of peace. When I say it that way, it sounds nice and clean and admirable. (laughs) If my kids are in conflict with one another, I face the temptation to rise above their conflict. Now, I don't mean my character rising above their conflict. That would be great. No, my voice rising above their conflict. Now, by God's grace, there's been some growth here, but my love for peace in my home can supersede my love for the Lord at any given moment. I'm one moment away from bowing at the altar of peace. Let me ask you this. Do you feel like you cannot be happy in the Lord if He doesn't give blank, or if he doesn't do blank. Now, whatever you may have filled that blank with likely has an idolatrous place in your heart. Because if he says no to your greatest desires, he is still good, and he is still God. We've got to deal honestly with ourselves, folks. What are we saying, Lord, I'm going to hold out on you until you stop holding out on me? And then we got to crucify that. It's fine to want good things. It's right to want good things. But when we want them too much, the good things we want devour us. It affects your joy. It affects your ability to serve. It affects your worship. How could it not? you're already worshiping something else. We can make idols out of our desires. Number three, we make idols out of God's good gifts. And this is when we take the very things God has given us as good and we adulterate them by placing them either above God or in place of God. We heard in the scripture reading this morning that Israel left Egypt plundering their silver and gold. Do you remember that from the passage? This was God's good provision for them, for their own welfare and the crafting of items for the tabernacle. Yet, later in Exodus, in Exodus 32, they take this good gift and they melt it down and literally craft an idol out of it. They craft a golden calf. God provides for us today. And he has entrusted to each one of us varying levels of financial provision. Is our money being put to use for God? Or is it acting as God in our lives? Are we finding security in how much we have? Now some of you may laugh right away at that. How in the world am I going to find security in what I've got? Well, the opposite is it equally an idol. Are you insecure because of how little you have? Our confidence is in God, not in what we have. God has given many of us able bodies, mouths to talk, feet that walk, hands that move. Are we putting them to use for God, or are we using them to craft 
our socially acceptable idols? Do we fail to act in boldness for God because of our idolatry of fear or rejection? Use what God has given you for Him instead of bowing to it as Him. Let me hit a couple more. Our church is a gift from God. And I love Covenant Fellowship Church. But God is not confined to this place. God is bigger than Covenant Fellowship, and we must never idolize this church. God has given pastors to the church as a gift and as self-serving as this may be, I love the pastoral team of this church. But God is bigger than the pastoral team. And we must never idolize the men who serve on it. Please come to us when you need help. But don't come to us as provider and helper and the great counselor and a refuge in where you can run in to hide. We'll point you to him. But don't look to us as him. We can't take God's good gifts and worship them. The fire and the cloud that went ahead of God's people were gifts from God, but they were not God. The Ark of the Covenant contained the word of God, among other things, but this gift from God was not God. We must think rightly about God or we will forever be prone to worshiping and serving what God has given rather than God himself. We'll end up worshiping the creature or the created thing above the creator. Paul rebukes the Corinthians for this in 1 Corinthians 3. He says, what then is Apollos? What is Paul? Servants through whom you believed as the Lord assigned to each. I planted, Apollos watered, but who gave the growth? God gave the growth. Listen to this statement. Neither he who plants nor he who waters is what? Is anything. But only God who gives the growth. You see, in our flesh, we instinctively want to create gods we can manage. Gods we can touch. Gods we can handle and control. Gods we can see, but in the end, what we create is no God at all. We've simply carved, then we've bowed, and we've called it God. But we serve a jealous God who's going to contend for your heart. Through the shall nots of this command, we also see a wonderfully implied shall that's captured in John 4, listen to this. This is the opposite of this command. God is spirit. He's not wood. He's not stone. He's not metal. He's not flesh. He's not bone. He's spirit. God is spirit. And those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. Because God is spirit, we don't create an, uh, an image of God to worship. What do we do? We centralize truth in our worship. Not a wood statue, not a carved image. We centralize truth. And this explains the crucial centrality of the Word of God in worship. It's why we sing it. It's why we read it. It's why we preach it. We're allowed to paint a picture of Jesus or craft a dove out of clay. We are not allowed to bow down to those. We must never venerate, consider holy, or bow down to good things, to representations of God, or to any, any of the saints who have gone before us. We must never pray to them. We must never bow down to them. Don't bend a knee to any but Jesus. We can be grateful for them. 
We can honor them, but we must not make a creature the object of our worship. Now, those are the shall nots. How do we fight it? How do we engage these prone to wander hearts in a way that leads to victory? First, we acknowledge our need. We've got to humble ourselves and we've got to acknowledge no matter how long you've been walking with Jesus, you've still got flesh that wants to run. We, like sheep, have gone astray. We love to possess a tangible, manageable God. We can find potential idols in whatever we prioritize, what we spend the most money on, what we fill our calendars with, what we do with our screens, what you derive the most comfort from when you're stressed or you're hurt. When you've had a rotten day, what can you not wait to do? Praying should be in there, folks. I can't wait to just unplug and watch TV. I can't wait to just get home and do X. It's fine to want those good things, but our comfort comes from the Lord. It does us no good to fool ourselves or to try to fool others. Don't put on a better show than what you got going on inside. Humble yourself. Ask for help is our second one. Number two, ask for help. Don't do it alone. Don't keep this to yourself. Allow others to know what you are at your worst, how strong you are at your weakest, and ask them for help in this area. Gloria Furman says, if you're not sure what your idolatrous affections might be, or you're at a loss for how you've been sinful, just ask your spouse or friends. They might hesitate at first to tell you, but it's not because they're doubtful that you're a sinner. They're trying to figure out how to break the news to you. (laughs) Now, that's funny when you're sitting in a large group. (laughs) But when you ask the question and that trusted friend pauses, (laughs) you better laugh then. Okay? You've got to laugh then. The only person who could laugh and say, oh, this is going to be worse than I thought, is the one who first humbles themselves and acknowledges their need. Then you're ready to receive the help you've just asked for. Third and lastly, adore your Savior. What an inoculation against idolatry. How do you stop yourself from loving idols? Just love Jesus more. Just love Jesus more. Idolatry gets its power when we believe lies about God. He's not strong enough. He's not loving enough. He's not present enough. He's not compassionate enough. He's not God enough. Those lies cannot exist in the face of blazing truth. And so we come to the cross. Come to the place where the grip of lesser gods gives way to the grace and mercy of Jesus Christ. You come exactly as you are. A pastor from a former church always used to say, God does not clean his fish before he catches them. You come to God dirty as you are. He'll take care of the cleaning. You just run to Jesus. You run to the cross. And you'll see the one who took all of the punishment for all of your idolatry. See the offer of freedom from idolatry. He extends to you as you enjoy his victory for you. Entrust yourself fully to the one who, listen to this, crushed the power of sin and death. So open your Bibles more frequently than Sunday mornings. 
so you can learn about this forgiving God. Read much about him so you can strengthen your mind with truth. Being able to identify when a counterfeit comes along. Discovering God's love and mercy. Discovering his attributes and his promises. Allowing this lyric to be true in your hearts. Listen, I will glory in what? In my Redeemer. That's where I'm going to glory. My life he bought. My love he owns. That's full devotion. I have no longings for another. Say that out loud with me, church. I have no longings for another because we are satisfied. We're satisfied in him alone. As you're satisfied in God, as you know him and believe him and trust him, you will rise above the temptation to worship lesser things. You will rise above the temptation to embrace counterfeits because no counterfeit will do when you possess the real thing. The love of Christ pursued us. The blood of Christ bought us. The resurrection of Christ sealed us. The promises of Christ sustain us. And we are firmly in his hands. So humble yourself and acknowledge your need. Ask for help. Adore the Savior. Leave behind whatever idols the Lord put his finger on in the last 30 minutes. Drag them from the darkness into the light. Why? Because Jesus is better. Jesus is greater. He's stronger. He will reward with love upon love, more than that idol you are cherishing ever could. And so church, today, let's devote ourselves to be faithful to Christ alone and be satisfied in him. Amen? Amen. Amen.